Okay. So the, needs to be recorded. So welcome uh, to you talking with Greg. Uh, it is my esteemed honor uh, to be here with two individuals who I have an enormous amount of respect for uh, and have connected to uh, in terms of their ideas uh, really since the beginning of my intellectual journey. Uh, so I have Paul Wachtel, uh, distinguished pro professor from City College of New York, uh, a co-founder of CEPI, uh, the Society for the Exploration of Psychotherapy Integration. Uh, he co-founded it with Marv. Uh, Paul's authored several books uh, that are really my favorite two in particular, our Psychoanalysis and Behavior Therapy back in 1977 and ongoing editions of uh, Therapeutic Communication. Uh, so Paul, welcome. Glad to be here. All right. Uh, and also we have Marv Goldfried, another distinguished professor. This is the first podcast where I've had two distinguished professors uh, in relation. Uh, he's at Stony Brook. He's the, also the co-founder uh, of CEPI uh, and uh, author or co-editor of the Handbook of Psychotherapy Integration, one of the other super influential books. Marv, thank, thanks for coming. Thank you. Looking forward to it. All right. Um, so the theme for us today is to talk about psychotherapy integration, uh, both its past, its present, and its future. Uh, as some of you may know, I'm the uh, elect of the president elect of the society uh, that Marv and Paul started. Uh, and what I thought we could do maybe is just touch in a little bit about some of that history. Uh, you guys are really the founders of this movement. Uh, so maybe each of you could give share a little bit about the background. Uh, and maybe I'll check in with a few questions, but just, hey, what started, how did, how did the two of you get hooked up uh, in relationship? Maybe we can start with you, Paul, in terms of just uh, some of the background uh, that laid the groundwork for, you know, here we are uh, in 2021. Uh, talking okay, about well, I, I, can, I can talk a little bit eventually about what got me into integration, how right. I, how I, how I moved from the original psychoanalytic point of view that I was trained in to being interested in integration. But in right. terms right. of um, how I got to know Marv, uh, when, and I'm leaving out for the moment, mm -hmm. a little bit of the path, but when I got on this path toward thinking, I've got to add some important things to the psychodynamic ways of working I was trained right. in, especially got interested in behavioral methods. Mm -hmm. um, thought it might be a good idea if I was gonna be talking about it and writing about it and practicing it to learn a little bit about it. Right. Because uh, I had not been trained in it really at all. Uh, and I uh, contacted at that point some of the leading people in behavior therapy uh -huh. uh, on the East Coast that I could reach, you know, right. in, in a reasonable amount of time. And the most fruitful of all of those was contacting uh, Mark Goldfried and Jerry right. Davison right. At Stanford and getting to sit in on uh, their postdoc classes out huh. at Work, so I became a, a, a kind of unofficial postdoc <laughs> once a week right. and watched through a one-way mirror, they and trainees practicing, and then Marv and Jerry and I had long discussions afterwards. And out of that, one of the other things that happened was Marv and I got to like each other right. uh, and got to really find each other's thoughts interesting and we got together with some regularity and began talking about maybe we should in some way, there are other people around the country and we later discussed interested in breaking down these barriers uh -huh. and maybe we should sort of facilitate people getting together and talking about it in just the way we were talking. All right, All right. Eventually it led to SEPI. Right. And it's my understanding that when you initially looked into it, you were pretty skeptical of kind of behavioral approaches at the, in the early phases. Is that accurate? Well, not by the time I went out to Stony Brook to uh, learn from Marv and okay. uh -huh. observe it, 
I, I wouldn't have made that right, journey. Right, 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 right. Uh -huh. Unless I, you know, by then felt there was something really important in it. But I certainly had been taught to be skeptical in my graduate training, in my postdoctoral psychoanalytic training, uh, and was skeptical for a long time. And that's, that's why sort of discovering that, hey, this awful, superficial, ridiculous stuff actually was important and effective and had a lot of evidence for it and so on. That came as a sort of a, an intellectual shock. Indeed, indeed. And you ended up uh, kind of framing this in terms of, wait a minute, psychodynamic analytic orients us towards insight and the capacity to sort of understand a particular way, the behavioral approach, action. And I think in, you know, in the mid 1980s, you produced action and insight as one of the, you know, as a way of uh, demonstrating or sharing that complementary uh, set of ideas. Right, that was certainly, uh, you know, one of the, one of the very important initial thoughts was how to put action and insight together and not just additively, but in a way where each would continuously lead to developments in the other so that right. changes in our interactions would yield insights, insights would yield changes in our interactions and they would continuously feed back in that way. Cool, all right. Uh, and so, Marv, uh, did, did did Paul show up out of the blue, or were you uh, were you thinking along these lines in other ways? How how was well, your well, my, journey? The, my journey, the road that I took, was was very very different. But we arrived in pretty much the same uh, the same place. Uh, when I was in graduate school, there was no behavior therapy. Mm. Uh, so, mm. um, it, or it was just beginning. And Wolpe's book was published in 1958 okay. uh, the, on the application of learning right. to clinical work. And basically, uh, so I approached my learning professor and said, this looks very, very interesting. And his comment was, I think it's a lot of crap. You'll <laughs> never go anywhere. So uh, it didn't go anywhere as far as I was concerned in graduate school, because most of the orientation that I took in was psychoanalytic as well, mm. psychoanalytic, okay. psychodynamic, um, because there was no behavior therapy. We read Rhoda, we read Kelly and things like that, but it was mainly psychoanalytic. Mm. Um, and then um, I spent three years on the faculty at University of Rochester when I heard about a university out on Long Island that was going to be building a clinical program based huh. on learning. Huh. And I applied and huh. I uh, got the job huh. and started teaching graduate students and postdocs. And then um, we had an accreditation by the American Psychological Association that huh. said that if uh, we continued teaching therapy the way we were teaching it, we would not get accredited. Wow that I would have to teach more than just behavior therapy. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. And I protested, but in order to have the program accredited, I decided, well, I'm gonna go back and look at my psychodynamic stuff. There wasn't that much ex experiential at the time. It's uh -huh, since, uh -huh. since then become much more dominant. Right. So I looked back at my notes and my marginal comments, and I found, and I found it very interesting that it's like, oh, you know, there are some similarities here. The language uh -huh. is very, very different, uh -huh. but some of the concepts are very much the same. Uh -huh. And that's what got me started. Okay. Um, are we separate, separated by different states of jargon or as Paul has commented on uh, X-rated terminology? Uh -huh. um, right. And the more I did, the more I became interested in. And then um, I just, it happened that I moved from Stony Brook to Manhattan, mm -hmm. and then Paul and I started having lunch together mm. to talk about this. And this was after mm. Paul had spent time at Stony right. Brook. Mm -hmm. And we would mm -hmm. meet for lunch and mm -hmm. have these great discussions, sometimes extending to the sidewalks of New York, mm. <laughs> uh, until we realized that this relationship has become too serious for lunch, and we started having dinner. Hello. That was, that was the beginning of <laughs> that's uh, a real beginning of, of, a, of a wonderful, really a long-standing relationship. Wow, beautiful. 
And so th this is like in the 19, late 1970s, 1980s, uh, what, the time frame? 70s, 80s, yeah. 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 Okay. And then when did it, so uh, I'm curious as kind of where the, was it an enormous amount of agreement between the two of you? Did you have, were there clear areas of disagreement that lasted over a period? Was it, um, was it a, just a collaborative effort about how to launch an, an exploration about dialogue and psychotherapy integration? I'm curious as to the tenor and its evolution. Well, I think, uh, I think first of all, clinically, um, wasn't so much we had disagreements, mm -hmm. but we had differences. Right. And Differences were just that we were coming to integration from the, from different directions right. at that point. Mm -hmm. And that's what made it interesting because mm -hmm. the idea was learning from each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Stan Messer has uh, introduced you know, fairly early in the process of an interesting concept of assimilative integration mm. where he points out that Yep. We never become completely converts. We always in some way are likely to start to continue with the framework that has made sense to us, right. but to modify it as we take in new things. So I think each version of integration in some way has a somewhat different flavor sure. depending on starting point. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly I didn't turn into Marv, Marv didn't turn into <laughs> me but we continued to learn from each other. And then as Marv was saying, began to get hungry for learning from other people uh -huh. as well. And that uh -huh. led to bringing more and more people in. Yeah, this, this was also fueled by another trend within behavior therapy that started in the late 60s. Okay. Continued through the 70s, namely the realization that using classical and operant conditioning mm -hmm. as a guideline for doing therapy, mm -hmm. while helpful in certain situations, simply didn't work in mm -hmm. other situations. Right. And that's where many of us at Stony Brook and other places started talking about the role of cognition. Mm -hmm. And as we started talking about the role of cognition, and I, rem I remember you saying, Paul, um, I know a lot about that. That's why, you know, that's more psychodynamic. It's the behavioral stuff I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. But it also served as a useful bridge um, for us to, to dialogue on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, my mentor, uh, you know, at, at least when as a postdoc, my mentor is Beck. Uh, and so, you know, his, his narrative about cognitive therapy and, and it created an integrative force. Although I know for you, Paul, you saw really the complementarity between behaviorism and psychodynamics to be uh, a particularly rich marriage where the cognitive approach uh, wasn't always as uh, elucidating of, of the kind of deep things, at least in a way that would transcend the psychodynamic view. Uh, but that's a, that is another layer of sort of that brought together potentially some bridging uh, in the domain. Well, I, I, I think one, one really important thing for people to be clear about in thinking about sort of the contours of our field. And uh, oddly here, I'm speaking not for exactly for Marv, but... <laughs> Thing that I that Marv has pointed out that I have found extremely uh, clear, clarifying, which is that our field often confuses cognitive therapy and CBT, mm. and that they're really not the same. And you know, I think what Marv was illuminating just before was CBT arose out of mostly people who were originally behavioral, right. adding a cognitive element, yep. took a different direction. And I think in a way, at least uh, part of my continuing in some way, dissatisfaction with Beck's version, mm -hmm. CBT, um, is Beck was trained in the exact same psychoanalytic framework I was trained in. Right. Uh, he was trained earlier, but he was mm -hmm. trained. You know, psychoanalysis changes slowly. <laughs> so, 
Right. Uh, he was trained in roughly the same approach. But, and, and I think in certain ways, we developed somewhat similar dissatisfactions. But I would say actually that the main difference between Aaron Beck and me at, at this point and over uh -huh. recent decades is that Beck is much more psychoanalytic than I am. Oh, really? Yeah, that's interesting. Huh. Um, actually, I'm curious is, about that. Can is you? That's all because you, you've become more yeah. behavioral? Yes, that's right. Okay. That's right. Whereas Beck is really still mostly an insight therapist, basically. Okay. It's that when you see the truth clearly, everything mm. follow. And I, you know, as you were pointing out, Greg, I'm much more in this dialectic between action and insight. Right. Not insight. Mm. The other thing that strikes me about your approach relative to Bex is your two-person relational, and we can get into this down the word, but the way in which you contextualize truth development, et cetera, in various contexts, and then in particular in the dyadic relational, both in terms of the nature of psychopathology and in, and in relation in the psychotherapy room. Right. And, th and that's what's also interesting about that, because another theme that I imagine will come up in various ways already has actually is dialectical thinking, which for mm -hmm. me is important and reflects how I see myself as well, as well as other people. And so I was saying, and I did mean it, that in many ways Beck is more psychoanalytic than I am. On the other hand, I have remained much more part of the psychoanalytic world and Definitely. movement than he has. And so I was in the psychoanalytic world as it became more relational. Mm -hmm. And he was already out of the psychoanalytic world when that happened so that he remained in the one person ego psychological framework. Right. Uh, and some of the limitations that I see in Beck's work from his being a one-person theorist when most of psychoanalysis later moved on to become two-person two theorists. That, that's, that certainly resonates with my sense of, of that, and I appreciate that. Um, Marv, in terms of sort of like the conversation into the vision of what Seppi uh, became and who else kind of perhaps got involved or, or what you saw and hoped as, as the conversations from dinner uh, started to evolve into the potential of a society. I'd be here, curious to hear, get that snapshot from your perspective of that slice uh, of history. Uh, not quite sure I, I get the essence of your question. What makes well, it? Can you tell me a little bit about then the transformation? So you guys are having dinner, you're, you're dialoguing a little bit. How did it go from that set of conversations? Who else got involved? And then how did it get to like oh, the co-founding oh, of SEPI I as see. a society? I mean, ba basically what Paul and I did is we, we compiled a list of people mm. who we knew within our orientation who might be interested in broadening their point of view. And you have to remember this was before the internet, so everything was paper and pencil. <laughs> right. um, it's amazing that we were able to do all of that without totally. the internet, but yeah. uh, we prevailed. And then I remember I visited uh, with uh, Hans Strupp, because <laughs> he was one of the people from a psychoanalytic camp. Mm -hmm. And he and I had been dialoguing because he was coming to the behavior therapy meetings Mm. because he was very much empirically oriented mm -hmm. and he wanted to see the kind of research that was being done. Right. So we developed a dialogue uh, and I uh, then spent a weekend at, uh, at his place and we mm. discussed at length. And I remember I stayed over and I was sitting on the bed getting to go to sleep and we were chatting. And then he said, Marv, you, you're going to need more than just a list of names mm. to make this work. Mm -hmm. Mm. That it would be a good idea to start some kind of organization. Mm. Okay. So that provided that. a transition. Then Paul and I was, were discussing that. And we were discussing organizations and organizations we've known and participated in didn't necessarily thrill us all that much. It's like, mm -hmm. oh my God, 
let's form something um, that's informal, mm. but brings people together. Mm -hmm. And let's do it in a very unusual way. Let's have a committee run it, mm. a huh. steering committee of people, uh, and, and use this as a way of you know, not getting too, uh, too much bureaucracy involved. Right. And we did that for a, num a number of years, and it worked for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And the, the society, was it like officially founded like in 1985 or 83? I can't quite remember. It's in that ballpark of 1985 to, or so? It was earlier. Yeah. Was it earlier? I, I, my recollection is that our first actual meeting was, may, may have been 85, which okay. was in Annapolis, Maryland. But we had... Mm -hmm. The organization existed gotcha. starting in 83, yeah. okay. and, mm -hmm. but we didn't actually have the meeting, first right. meeting. Mm -hmm. in wow. Yes, and then we, we had a, a newsletter um, that Paul and I, uh, did we co-edit it at the time? Yeah, yeah we, we did. Yeah. Right. Right, we did. And it was, um, it was this very low-tech mimeographed newsletter, and we would put in information uh, and send it to these people. Mm. So we sent the newsletter out, uh, even asking what could a good name be for our organization. Ah, okay, yeah. So we had the newsletter uh, and an informal group before we had a quote formal uh, mm -hmm. uh, organization. Mm. And then the formal organization was really very informal for a long period of time until more recent years when we've done things like elected offices and lots of committees and things like that. Right. And just for folks listening, it's the Society for the Exploration of Psychotherapy Integration. And you guys framed it precisely that way so that it was basically an invitation from people from various orientations to come together and begin the dialogue about the crossbreeding, integrative, eclectic, whatever it was in relation uh, to, to give it that flexibility, fluidity, and invitation from a wide variety of different domains. Yeah. Right, and that, and that, you know, we were aware that adding that word exploration made it hard to pronounce. You know, just <laughs> exploration of psychotherapy integration is a mouthful, uh, which is why SEPI is a godsend <laughs> as a referring to it. But we put it in because among the early people who were actually most active in SEPI in the earliest years were people who, to their great credit, were participating with us, even though they were skeptics about integration. Mm -hmm. They were interested enough to come and dialogue with us. They were not converts, as it were, to integration. So that word exploration provided a broad enough umbrella that they could feel welcome. Right. The spirit of the SEPI meetings was very, very different from any other meetings that most of us ever attended. Right. Um, other meetings where you sit down with a panel with somebody from other points of view, and the, your goal on the panel was to convince the other person that they were wrong and you were right. The goal of our meetings was to learn from each other. So the underlying guideline is get together and play nice. Mm -hmm. So it's a dialogos. <laughs> mm -hmm. what... yeah. Yes, yes, we, we did this back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Play nice and some of the best meetings where I learned the most was from audience participation. Mm. Mm -hmm. And we do have recordings of this somewhere on our website. So I, um, hopefully you'll give the commercial toward the end of how do people can join SEPI and find <laughs> the website. But we Absolutely. do have uh, audio recordings of some of this stuff. Uh, I don't know if it's, if it's all been converted to the new website okay. or not, but they exist somewhere. So we, we record it. I will put in the show notes in particular, the, where, the CEPI links and where people can join and all of that good stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, absolutely, so we can. Um, what was the reception? I mean, what was your, was this, 
did it sort of catch fire? Was it uh, feel like you were going uphill? How did, how did the field kind of respond? What's your sense looking back how the field responded to this initiative? Well, I, 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 I think for me, in a way, the biggest surprise, just because I hadn't really thought about it yet, was the number of people from other countries mm. who became involved. Because I think we first had a kind of what retrospectively seems like a very narrow vision of basically a North American organization. You know, we really had blind, we had, we thought we were, it was an organization devoted to taking off your blinders, theoretically, <laughs> but we still had in a way geographical blinders. And fortunately, somehow, despite our really not initiating that as much as we should have in retrospect, somehow people from around the world learned about it, became part of it, and it's now truly an international organization. And I think Marv and I and many CEPI members have made you know, wonderful, enduring relationships around the world through CEPI. But that was, a, I, I, for me, one big surprise. I think on the other hand, where it has remained an oddly small membership in some way is that an enormous portion of therapists answer inquiries indicating that they are integrative or eclectic in orientation. Yet there's this sort of uh, hidden underbelly to their identities where they still identify with an orientation and that's the organization they belong to. And I think we really, in a way, one of the things CEPI still needs is to draw in more of the integrative therapists around the world who know they're integrative, but somehow still think of, I should belong to a behavior therapy association or a, a psychoanalytic association or a humanistic association, but don't think about joining CEPI. And I think, you know, I think we have room for growth in that respect. Right, and, and certainly, as you mentioned before, Stan Mess's notion of assimilative integration, where you keep your identity, but you are open to other things that may benefit your clinical intervention. Um, one of the, and I don't know how much I've ever told you about this, Paul, um, one of the initial reactions uh, by a behavior therapist uh, was very negative. This happened to be a former Stony Brook student, Terry Wilson, mm -hmm. at his presidential address at the Association for the Advancement of Behavior Therapy was devoted primarily to um, lambasting me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah, I think that w one of the things for people to be aware of, and I came a little late into this game, things had already changed. Thanks, many thanks to you guys. So I get trained uh, in my master's program, and this is when I wake up to psychotherapy integration uh, in 1993. Uh, I get my second course uh, in, in psychotherapy, which is then taught by somebody uh, influenced by you. The handbook of psychotherapy integration had just come out, and that was our text. Um, I, I had come in with sort of an empirical CBT view, um, and maybe fortunately, and <laughs> maybe not, I don't know, but, but the way it worked was I actually had a pretty lousy CBT supervisor initially. Uh, then I had this uh, sort of existential integrative um, supervisor who was beautiful in, in, in cultivating in me some of the things that uh, you know, I needed to get in touch with and heart and body and philosophy and things like that. And then it was then that primed me so that I had my second uh, class and was taught by, uh, from somebody coming from a psychotherapy integration view. Um, and really the message basically was, hey, the best of the best do the best and let's look and see what they have to offer. Um, and that just, that was unbelievably transformative to me. And, and what that meant was for me, I didn't have to get rooted into the identity of the schools. And that's the point I wanted to make is that especially in the seventies and eighties, um, the field of psychotherapy is very, very framed 
uh, by the structure of the schools of thought that are dominant, the orientations. Well, you know, Greg, um, this brings up a very interesting point. Uh, when Jerry Davison and I published our book in 76, Clinical Behavior Therapy, mm. uh, at that time, there was nothing, there was nothing, no such thing as CBT. Hmm. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. CB, the la label CBT didn't come until later right. uh, in the early 80s. And what we said was, yes, behavior therapy is the extrapolation of research from classical and operant conditioning uh -huh. to, from the laboratory to the clinic. But it's not a new school. It's uh -huh. a new approach to therapy which essentially is let's some let's take what we know empirically about human functioning mm. and use that within the clinic situation as opposed to deriving this information solely from clinical work. Huh. That's fascinating. And that was I see that as revolutionary. Yep. And of course it's it comes back now in the term of translational uh, research from beds from, from bench to bedside, although right. it's a biological bench to the medical bedside uh, <laughs> for the most part. Right. Uh, but this notion of, uh, it's not just that it's learning. The problem was that's what was available in the 50s. Mm. There was not a lot of research on cognition, if at all, right. Right. or on emotion or on other areas, mm -hmm. or there was some research in social psychology and research in social psychology, and I'm sure Paul, you're going to agree to this, has direct implications for clinical work, such as research on the self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. So the notion is, so the note of how behavior therapy started and then it, then it evolved into CBT, it seems like a school, but from my point of view, it's not a school. That's fascinating. Yeah, that's re that's really interesting, Paul. I'd be, love to get your take on that. What's your what is you, where are you in relationship to psychotherapy and you know sort of the field of research or however we want to kind of frame that? Yeah, well, for, first of all, um, just to affirm Marv's uh, confident hypothesis, uh, he had reason to be confident. Uh, <laughs> to indeed, see social psychology enormously important contributor to the research foundation of, of psychotherapy. Um, and I, I agree that the more we can base practice on solidly grounded research, the better off we are. Uh, I would add two things to that. Um, one, I would slightly modify the way Marv put it, and I here I'll 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 make the hypothesis that Marv would agree with me here, but I actually am not a hundred percent sure of that one. That uh, it's not just basing it on well-developed research, well-controlled empirical research of all sorts. I, because Mark was making it clear, it's not by now, certainly, not just operant and classical conditioning research by any stretch of the imagination, but it's not just even just cognitive research, it's social psychology, developmental psychology, and so on. But I think when Marv framed it as, it, it could sound, and I don't think this was his intent, instead of clinical observation, I don't think he meant that, but I think he, what he was responding to appropriately is that for so many years, clinical work was grounded only on clinical observation. And that's very, very vulnerable. Right. Uh, ironically, and there are still psychoanalysts who defend the idea that all we need is the clinical case study. We don't need empirical research. And ironically, the very essence of psychoanalytic theory shows why that's not uh. because psychoanalytic theory is about how readily we can deceive ourselves <laughs> what we want to see and <laughs> Paul. yeah no i assumed you would um but 
you know, the, the empirical studies are enriched by clinical observation and vice versa. And I know, I know Marv is in agreement with that. One of Marv's most prominent students, uh, Louis Castonguay, has done a lot of work on Louis. research, uh, practitioner collaborations. Oh. <laughs> exactly. Right. Okay. <laughs> this is his latest book. This is the second edition published mm -hmm. by Guilford, which is both an abnormal text, but a resource where the chapters were written by researchers and clinicians. Uh, yeah. Right. And that's, and that's, of course, another important element of CEPI that, that Marv was the most important person in introducing, which is that CEPI extending its, uh, its mission from dialogue among people of different orientations to also include dialogue among clinicians and researchers and a two-way conversation there where again, in SEPI fashion, each learns from the other. Uh, Paul, let me interrupt a second because sure. I don't want to lose this point that you mm -hmm. made. Uh, you made the point that clinical work, um, I think you said ancillary. I'm not sure. I, I, don't, I don't think I said ancillary. I no. think it's primary. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 I think that, and, and uh, sociologists or philosophers of science have written about the context of discovery and the context of justification. And the context, before you do research, you need to observe informally whether the, the likelihood of the phenomenon existing. And some people who, uh, like Neil Miller, has said he wasted lots of time developing elegant studies for a phenomenon that was not there. So clinical work is the context of discovery. And I think some of the British psychologists have noted this uh, in their sarcastic comment when they said that research that is born out of the literature is destined to be buried in it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> the research that is born out of clinical observation is destined to be used by clinicians. Mm. So this is a really interesting point because I think it, it highlights sort of the research practice uh, interface and and I, then I'll add this sort of, and the for me, one of the things that I struggle a lot with, and, and this is relevant in relationship to the orientations, is then the theory, research, practice uh, kind of triangle, they interface between uh, all of those. Uh, but but I want to emphasize here the idea that central to CEPI, and at least we're you know, getting uh, elucidating this, is this linkage. And, and the way you said it, Marv, is really interesting. The behavior therapy, clinical behavior therapy, is really about, OK, what are the fundamental empirical principles that first, though, if we are grounded centrally in clinical observation, that we may then draw and utilize that as some foundational understanding uh, and sort of test and balance and grounding uh, between uh, the clinical work that we do and a scientific base for it. So that, that's that's interesting and important from my vantage point to, to hear. So that's a, and I think that then for CEPI in terms of its identity, this, and, and that's certainly been around, but to solidify it as research theory practice interface uh, to cultivate that core. I, I very much like that three-way way of putting it that you just introduced because both clinical work and empirical research are very much shaped by theoretical presuppositions. You know, we never just observe a clinical phenomenon. We never just objectively design an experiment. Those are always filtered through our theoretical presuppositions. Then hopefully we hold those presuppositions lightly enough that we're also influenced by what we observe in each of those two contexts. But if we leave out theory, it all sounds much too objective. And right. you know, theory is but, the prism but, or the filter. But, but here's the key. And you know, one, of, one of the major problems we have uh, is that we are communicating with words rather than observing phenomena. So if the, what do we mean by theory? Yes. I have a notion of theory as being um, learning theory, um, uh -huh. psychoanalytic 
theory, Gestalt theory, something that's pretty abstract and can get very, very abstract, as you will know, Greg, because you love that, that kind of stuff. Um, so high level theory is um, maybe too high level for me. I don't know whether you would consider this theory or not, but I see the change process as going from um, a, a person, not person's life not working, uh, but they don't know why their life is not working. And they go to therapy to try to figure that out. Um, it could be that they're symptomatic, that their relationships are bad, that they're His, the work history is bad. It's just not working. Uh, and then with the aid of the therapist, they're helped to see, to become aware. So they start off by being unaware of what we can call their incompetence. And mm -hmm. just bear with me. I'm, I have mixed feelings about that term, but <laughs> you'll see where it goes. So there's an unconscious incompetence. And therapy provides them with a greater awareness of those factors that are contributing to their problem, which could be distorted expectations, uh, inappropriate emotions, problematic actions, negative views towards self. And these are either, these interact with each other and cause the problematic behavior Uh, so becoming aware of why it's not working brings you to conscious incompetence. Now, how do you get there? Well, there are different, different ways of me mentioning. You could say, well, it's insight. Or you could say, no, it's mentalizing. No, it's decentering. No, it's reflective functioning. No, it's metacognition. You can have different words for it. But my understanding, and I'd be curious to see if, if, if I'm not making any hypothesis, Paul. <laughs> curious to see whether you, you've sent He has no things. theory of what you're thinking, Paul. <laughs> so it's, it's the person becoming aware of the problematic interaction among these various factors when they are occurring. So it's not just an intellectual awareness. It's their ability to step back and say, oh, yes, I'm angry now, and I'm withdrawing. And then when I withdraw, my partner says that I don't care. Or I'm fearful now, and I'm withdrawing, and my partner says I don't care. But it's not that I don't care. It's just that I'm fearful. And maybe I need to become less unfearful or communicate with my partner. So they become aware of what it would be like to become competent. And so they move from conscious incompetence to conscious competence. And that's where action comes in. So, so far we're talking about insight and now we're moving over into action. And what, wasn't the title of your book, Insight and Action? It was a Action and Insight. Oh, Action and Insight. <laughs> okay, so I've got to flip it around the other way. It's a, it's a dialectical feedback. Okay, yes. But it is, right. Yes, it, uh, yeah. right. If the book's so title now, could be in a circle, that would have been better. <laughs> so now they try it, and it's like, oh my goodness. I thought X would happen, that my partner would say that and he and she didn't, and it's like, oh my gosh. So the, it's not just action, but it's, action that corrects distorted thinking and feeling. And that's conscious competence. And that, you can call it working through, you can talk, talk about it as a lot of what goes on during the course of therapy, if therapy is working. And over a period of time, if you're lucky, and if the patient works hard enough, um, it becomes more automatic to unconscious competence. Now, is that the question is, would you label that theory? And would you and or do you see this as being relevant? 
Maybe the first question, is that theory? I, I would say theory can operate at many different levels. There are sort of grand theories, there are mid-level theories, there are micro theories. I think part of where our field has gotten caught up is that some of what we call theories are really identities. You know, that there are there is such a range of views, say, among cognitive behavioral people or among psychodynamic people that, uh, and, and there are important ways in which some, like for example, there are constructivist cognitive therapists and there are constructivist relational psychoanalysts. And I think if you look closely, they often have more in common with each other not only in their theory, but even in their ways of working than they do with their supposed, um, you know, colleagues in the cognitive behavioral world or in the psychodynamic world. So that part of what gets confused is that we, and this is part of what Seppi is still working at transcending, is that some of these grand labels, psychoanalytic, cognitive behavioral, and so on, really are more identity labels than uh, clearly uh, identifying descriptions of a, of a precisely different theory. Yeah. No, sure, you know, people become Adlerians, Jungians, et cetera. But I don't consider my conceptualization of the four stages of change as being, quote, theory. Do you believe that is theory? When you, it, does that fit into your categorization of theory I would think at of all? it as a theory. Pardon? I, I, I would see it as a theory because it's, okay. a, it's a way of abstracting from an enormous number of observations into a kind yeah. of formulation. And in that sense, to me, it's okay. Well, that's, that's an important clarification, because when I think about theory, I think about theorists mm. who own theories. That's the problem, exactly. Yes, that's the identification yes. thing that, that yes. Paul was talking about. What is it? Yeah. Um, there's nothing as good, nothing as useful as a good theory. There is nothing right. as dangerous as a live theorist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll take care of that. <laughs> so the other thing too, Paul, can you see this mapping on to the way you view therapy, these stages? And I'm not saying that, that you know, it's lockstep mm -hmm. because sometimes yeah. you've got to go back. Right. And other issues come up. I certainly see it as one important description of an ongoing process in therapeutic change. Uh, I think, and again, it's somewhat odd since I come from the psychoanalytic end of things, I think it highlights awareness a little bit more than I would. Mm. In the sense that I think an awful lot of the learning that goes on in, in therapy is procedural learning mm -hmm. and learning that maybe never gets put into words, but that pr can profoundly shape emotional experience and behavior. Um, so in, in that sense, I would want to add that. And, and it relates to um, what I think was one of the great tragedies in the history of psychoanalytic thought and practice, uh, which was the rejection of Alexander's concept of the corrective emotional experience. I know Mark has been a very strong opponent of the corrective emotional experience, has really written about it in very illuminating ways, so I don't expect he would disagree with this, but I think in some way, some aspects of the corrective emotional experience uh, 
occur procedurally and may or may not ever reach consciousness, but can still profoundly influence the way the person goes about living in the world. Yeah. Well, this is an interesting, very interesting point, because um, in my supervision of students, if there's a cognitive distortion of a given schema that's creating the problem, and that leads to a behavior that becomes you know, cyclical, psychodynamic, or self-fulfilling, I will say, let's go for the behavior change. Mm -hmm. Because that's faster and easier. The cognitive change is very, very hard. And cognitive change is based on using behavior to update schemas. So let's cut to the chase. The only thing, and, and yes, sometimes the patient will not be aware. They'll say, oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that worked out real well with a tone of surprise in their voice, which to me is a marker of change. And that, that's a notion I got from reading psychoanalytic analytic literature in graduate school. When a person says, yeah, it did work out. You should then label that as change and then process that. So what I do is I will process that to get them to become aware of how they managed at the crossroads when in that situation to go toward action rather than avoidance so that they have a heuristic. So we process it so it can become aware so that they can use it. So I don't disagree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That it, uh, and, and the corrective experience, I think, is the, probably the most important aspect of change. It's just the question of how to, how to get it implemented. <laughs> yeah. How to facilitate yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, what's interesting is, you know, what the, the, the conversation Marv and I have been having in the last five minutes is a very good example of what CEPI is about. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Because I think each of us both came to understand more clearly what the other was saying uh -huh. and to modify our own view a little bit in light of what the other was saying. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so we each, I think, come away a little bit different from how we saw things even five minutes ago. Right. right. And, 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 here's, and here's the nub of it. Uh -huh. And then we'll take the... the well, let's let's take um, um, let's take the example of the corrective experience of so the person doing something differently. A CBT person would may implement this awareness by having a person use worksheets mm. of past events. Oh, here's what happened today. So you write it down, and then you look at it, and it's like, oh my goodness. Yes, now I'm using my metacognitive ability to see what went on emotionally that I was expecting someone so to do something, and that's why I got angry. That's interesting. So that's insight. From a psychodynamic point of view, it's called timing of interpretation, where the person is distorting something, and you then point it out, and they go, oh, my goodness, yes. I see I'm angry and this person, my partner never even said they wouldn't do it. So what we have is different techniques for implementing the same principle. And then the question is, well, which is better? Are you allowed as an analyst to have a person do thought records? Am I as a CBT person allowed to make an interpretation in session? Well, yeah. So, yeah, one of the things I'd like to maybe uh, just double back on, because this was very, that was something you said, Marv, that's very important in terms of my own, that, that nothing so dangerous as a living theorist. Because um, I experienced this front hand at the University of Pennsylvania when I, was, when I was working with Beck. And we did a lot of good work and it just had his 100th birthday, so I want to honor him. But it's also the case that there, it was pretty disturbing some of the stuff that we ended up doing there. Um, that speaks to the importance that I have in connecting 
psychotherapy to the science of human psychology at some level. Now we can talk about how to do that. Um, but so to give you an example, I, I got there to, um, I think Paul, you know some of the story, but anyway, I got there uh, in 1999. Uh, Beck had just put out a grant uh, to study individuals who recently made a suicide attempt. Uh, the people that structured that for the pilot um, did a good job, uh, they did that. And then we got an NIMH and CDC grant um, but the people that actually set it up left, <laughs> they were postdocs and other things. And then the psychiatric nurse also left. So I got there and it got funded by both the CDC and the NIMH. And I was a postdoc and then I got placed in pro the project director role. Um, and I knew a little bit about CBT, but we're talking about individuals. Everybody that came in the study had within the week, I believe that's the time frame, had to have made a genuine and serious suicide attempt in inner city Philadelphia. Okay, uh, so by definition, everybody that's coming in is a pretty serious uh, case of psychopathology. Uh, and then we were gonna randomize control clinical trial, uh, them to either treatment as usual initially or the care conditions, a brief cognitive therapy intervention. So I tried to run this study um, and it was unbelievably difficult. Uh, and in fact, uh, I finally, first I had to solve the recruitment problem, which took about three months. Like how, where are these people? How do you get them in? What do you say to them to bring them in? What do you do when somebody is, oh, I'm really excited. And then they get the treatment as usual. They're disappointed, et cetera. Anyway, I figured that out. And then we started running the um, protocol and we got 60 people in the first year. We were actually ahead of schedule. Um, and half of them got assigned to treatment as usual, half, uh, to cognitive therapy. Uh, but what happened in that context is that they wouldn't come to therapy. therapy. Yeah, it's cognitive not, therapy. Not uh, cognitive behavior therapy. Not bad, no, it's classic Beckian cognitive therapy uh, where basically you're uh, identifying the thoughts, uh, problems. Uh, it's a really interesting study and a lot of things positive to say about. But here's what happened in the design that gets to your point about if we frame ourselves committed to a school of thought that has to be and are not open to the empirical evidence that's before us observationally, even as if this is framed as a science. But basically what happened was this. So we brought people in and I got the first 60 people in, half of them assigned to cognitive therapy, half of them assigned treatment as usual. But you know, one quarter of these folks were homeless, uh, more than half below the poverty line. Uh, surprisingly enough, they were very difficult to track. Uh, and they were also very, they didn't show up at the sixth floor for the Center for Cognitive Therapy where we would assign on Tuesday at two o'clock. <laughs> they wouldn't go, you know. Uh, and indeed, after we had run the study for a year, um, what we found was one third had gone for more than three sessions. One third went from one to three and one third never showed up for the first session, okay? So then we look at the one year annual review and like, oh my God, the study's not working at all. We're not delivering the intervention, okay? And then we bracketed that, created st that as study one. Beck got hot um, and lit a fire under me. And we also poured a few more in, uh, and really it was an unbelievably intense time. And we rebuilt, reconstructed the study and ran what became study two. Now study two involved a lot more attention to the students, uh, to the patients. I actually took over the therapy. We hired somebody else. Um, we created a, a, an enriched care for the control condition. And I delivered the therapy through the, set, through the psychopathology research unit, as opposed to sending the, the patients over. Um, so the entire structure changed. Now we were successful ultimately in running this. We got 60 in each group. We got a good effect uh, in relationship to this. But here's the thing that always frustrated me. Um, what, what came out was cognitive therapy for, for people who made suicide attempts. And that got published in the Journal of American Medical Association. And the argument basically was, hey, look at the positive effect that we get in this randomized control trial, okay? But actually from the backside, what I saw was, hey, we set this up and it was a nightmare. <laughs> Standard cognitive therapy run through standard psychotherapy delivery treatment mechanisms doesn't deliver the treatment, and we prove that. Then we developed, I, I sort of had the imagined thought experience. If we had consulted with a social worker and implemented everything that we did, the actual consequence would have been effective treatment delivery for marginalized populations. That essentially is what the empirical findings were. But because we were framing the entire thing through the paradigm of cognitive therapy, that was the research question. And all of those changes were then justified in relationship to, well, they're necessary for treatment delivery, but not a not crucial to the question that were offered. So they're right. tangential. This is, this is so timely. 
um, lower SES people who are having difficulty functioning in the world, do they, and they're depressed, do they need to change their cognitions? I mean, there well, were yes. <laughs> if, if, if my therapy says this is the key cognitive, this is the fee, ver- fee, this is the key variable cognition. Right. But research has shown that if you get severe depressed people, and then this is no, no longer lower SES, where it's very obvious that it's the wrong therapy. If you get people who are very depressed and functionally impaired, behavior therapy for some strange reason works better than cognitive therapy. Getting them to function in their life better is more likely to relieve the depression Mm -hmm. than to change their distorted thinking. Now I deliberately put it this way, which makes it ludicrous, I think, to think otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I guess I just wanted to reiterate your point that we need to be very careful about the ways in which, and this is why I think that a lot of like, I think we would all agree that randomized controlled clinical trials run based on brands um, creates all sorts of different difficulties in terms of drawing generalizable conclusions uh, from things that come out of the, so, so from one of the things that I'm definitely passionate about that I think I share with both of you is that we want to connect it to the phenomena uh, theoretically, research and practice to the phenomena, not to the alphabet soup uh, or to the egos or to the schools of thought. Is that a is that a fair assumption and, yeah. and frame that we I, all share? I, yeah, I, th- I think this is a really important topic, and um, you know, I think first of all, apropos the last thing that you were sort of alluding to, I think our field has suffered from what I like to call acronymphomania, uh, you know, that, that we just, every time you sneeze differently, it's a new acronym and supposedly a new brand. And it's, it's really depressing to see how often that happens. Well, there's a saving grace, Paul, and that is it makes for good um, alphabet soup. <laughs> it does, <laughs> that's true. Uh, if that's your taste, alphabet soup, I think my, my three-year-old grandson would consume it with relish, uh, but I'm not sure that our field should, yeah. as I, I, I hear you certainly agree. But I think also, Greg, you're pointing to a, another really important uh, element, which is that when when we're all agreeing about the importance of of research as one of the really key foundations for our practice and for progress, the problem is our field has been enchanted and not enchanted, you know, enchanted in a very problematic way, like a a black magic spell. Uh by randomized controlled trials. Uh, I really think, you know, it's like a mindless copying of medicine, where if I am going to take a new medication, I do want it to have been tested via a randomized controlled trial. But we know in medicine, you know, when these, you know, when a randomized controlled trial is done, it's not worth its salt if it isn't double blind. Right. Sort of a standard thing that you learn virtually in the very first day of any class that teaches you how to do it. There has never been in the history <laughs> of psychotherapy research, a single, because it's impossible to do, a double blind psychotherapy research project. Imagine a study where the patient doesn't know what kind of treatment he's receiving, and the therapist doesn't know what kind of treatment he's giving. Uh, it's, It's absurd. And especially in an area where interpersonal influence 
is of the very essence of what we're offering to go through this charade of randomized controlled trials as the golden, you know, the, the gold standard. And, and let me be very clear. I'm not saying we should never do randomized controlled trials. Totally. They do offer one kind of evidence which has value when combined with many other kinds of evidence. Paul, let me jump in here. I agree with everything you said, except one word that you used. Okay. And I know you love words. <laughs> <laughs> it's not mindless. It's based on an assumption. Mm. It okay. was based I on the change in the paradigm of mental illness within the NIMH uh, back in the 80s. And we've documented this. Barry Wolf and I have documented this. And Barry Wolf has documented it because at the time he was at the NIMH oh. and he saw it happening. And it moved in a medical direction that oh. these were diseases uh -huh. and they had to, we had to think of them as diseases. Right. And we treat the disease, the symptomatology. We don't treat the problematic thinking or the problematic behavior. So it went. So it went from outcome research, where we were targeting procrastination, uh, unassertiveness, very focal types of things, to using a complex treatment package to target a complex and heterogeneous mm. disorder which has multiple etiologies, which can have multiple etiologies. But it was based on an assumption. Huh. And then eventually there was the realization that it was a wrong assumption. It's not the same as giving a pill. <laughs> Who would have thunk it? <laughs> we did. Yeah, the well, time, there you go. You know. we, wrote, we, wrote a paper, we wrote papers in the American Psychologist and Journal of Consulting and Clinical saying, no, 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 no. And in doing so, they took money away from process research hmm. as to how change occurs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that actually brings us then a little bit to maybe kind of, so I think we've covered sort of the past up into, into the present a bit. Um, and I, maybe I'd like to talk to a present into future just a little bit for us to think about where things are. So. Um, you know, Marv and I, with Jeffrey Smith, uh, Paul, had an opportunity to talk mm -hmm. about uh, psychotherapy and on what can we agree and whether or not um, the cultivation of a common core of psychotherapy uh, would be possible. I think we achieved some consensus along those lines, or at least the outline of such uh, of consensus. And as yeah. a founding member, I'm really curious to get your thoughts about a common core of psychotherapy and, you know, kind of what what your feeling would be in relationship to that enterprise. Let me, let me start okay. since I was, you know, like, just let me elaborate on my core, on my, my assumption and, and hand it over to, uh, to Paul. Um, since I was part of the, the threesome, um, yep. <laughs> obviously. Please. <thank> you. <laughs> but just to add an, an, an addendum, um, an experience that, that I had a few months ago uh, gave me an epiphany. Um, I had some physical problem, um, and at my age, I don't remember which one it was. <laughs> uh, so I went online, and I made sure that I, I, I went to trusted.org websites, and I found out about the problem, and I found out about um, the treatment, and some of this was stuff I was able to do, and I felt so much better. As a matter of fact, I did something like this this morning about making a decision. Should I have astigmatism lens change when I have the cataract surgery or should I not? And I was able to find out what the field said about it. We don't have that. Now you can say, well, people don't need help for their mental health. Well, of course, <laughs> that has changed. It's always been the case and it's changed drastically. So on what can we agree? Is there anything we can put out to the public that we agree on?
I think I think that's a different question in a way, what we put out to the public and what we find useful as therapists. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, when I, when either, I, either one, you know, it's fine. When I, when, when I looked at the, uh, the, the core ideas and principles that the three of you uh, described in that discussion, uh -huh. there mm -hmm. was there was nothing in there that I at all disagreed with. Uh -huh. um, the problem for me, just again, more thinking, not so much as a critique of that effort, but as the going back to the framing of the future that uh -huh. you that you put it, Greg, is that the devil is in the details, yeah. and that. On the basis of those principles, it isn't so clear what I should do when a patient walks into my office, uh -huh. especially when, uh, you know, when I, you know, even something as basic as the importance of the therapeutic relationship. Okay. Uh -huh. You know, I, I, I 100% agree about the importance of it. But when the patient does X, what do I do to enhance uh -huh. therapeutic relationship? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That there are so many details that, and here I'm not arguing for nihilism at all. I'm, I'm arguing for, a, in a way, ambition and further work. Uh -huh. that or we are describing sort of at ground level things we can do while reminding ourselves that there are frameworks that help guide us. Uh -huh. in, uh, I think that's part of where I yeah. see. The future. So yeah. I'm not, okay. just not that excited about w what our consensus is right now because it still feels rather general. Mm. Let me tell you why I am excited. Because rather than the alphabet soup as the starting point for our research, training and practice, I think what we agree on from different orientations and, and also what we see empirically and clinically, what we all agree on becomes the starting point for future research, for training. And efforts are being made, for example, in training by Chris Moran, Catherine Eubanks, James Boswell, Mike Constantino, on training, making videotapes of here's what you do when you have a problem in the Alliance or notice the tone of voice or facial expression. This is a marker now for you to do X. And the reason to do it is not only does it make good clinical sense, but we also have some research to show that it repairs the alliance. So this is the, this is the groundwork. This is the foundation for the future, the low level uh, theoretical constructs that we can agree on both as clinicians and researchers and across orientations becomes the foundation on which we build rather than clinical trials, rather than developing still another school of thought. I, th I, I, I certainly like, especially the second half, you know, the, the rather than part, um, I think it's more productive than premature clinical trials. Um, and I think the, the question is, again, it's not, I, I don't disagree on any of those principles. Uh, the only thing I might disagree on is how, um, comprehensive they are, uh -huh. you know, it, 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 is that 
it, it's that there's none of them that I would say, no, that's not relevant or important, not a one. But if you ask me, is that, are those the only guidelines? Absolutely so not. Totally mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. No. The foundation of a house is not the entire house. But uh, is that and, and, the and entire foundation? The, the, the notion of becoming aware has multitude components. So when I do supervision, I don't tell my supervisees, well, he, this person needs to become aware. I'll talk about what the person needs to become aware of. And also talk about the individual differences, which we call moderator variables of different types of individuals who can become more aware more readily than other types of individuals. We know about that, some of that stuff clinically. That's called the context of, dis of discovery in research. And the research needs to talk about those patient characteristics, those variables associated with the clinical problem, with the person's environmental situation that need to be taken into consideration. So it's a building up. It's a bottom up, but this on a foundation. But obviously, I totally agree. It's not enough, but it's a start. Yeah, for me, what... It, it, my general philosophy is sort of an integrated pluralism uh, at a dialectic view, meaning that there's a tension between some sort of unity and agreement, uh, and at the same time, very important differentiations uh, that can move in relationship to that. Um, so what, for me, the common core begins to feel like is a particular kind of center uh, that can afford enough unity across a common ground like, for example, the idea of maladaptive patterns or entrenched maladaptive patterns, if the field of psychotherapy could, you know, delineate that as a consensual aspect of the key core of what it is that we treat, that would position it slightly differently than the DSM in a particular way. I think of the yeah. British Psychological and, Society. You know, and the, most people don't know this, but Paul, um, I took your side back, I don't know when, in the debate with Walter Michel where he was saying all behavior is specific and you were saying, no, there are consistent patterns and that's why people are having pr problems um, because they're not being appropriate to the situation. Mm. And then I think so, he reneged a little bit. Yeah, his later view there. certainly would, would seem to suggest that there were generalizable patterns, although he always cultivated the situation specific aspect. But anyway, yeah, that's a... Um, right, although the marshmallow test is not... Yeah, no, bring back <laughs> the, the old watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> your classic person situation debate's yeah. a good one. Um, yeah. But that but was I, a great, I, that was a great I, debate. Was it in JCCP? It was in the Journal of Abnormal. Of Abnormal. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. It's and, a shame, you know, right. that, that we... We can't assign these. I mean, I can assign these, but then the rest of the faculty say students are complaining. <laughs> there are too many readings. Right, mm -hmm. right. There's definitely not these days. <laughs> right, right. Paring down my reading list each year is one of the hardest tasks I've That's faced. right. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Yeah. yeah. But I think just, you know, just to sort of come back to this last theme, I think part of, part of what, uh, we're also talking about is what ways of framing the foundation are evocative for a particular clinician or researcher. Uh -huh. For example, I'm thinking of, you know, when you were saying more of uh, maybe 15, 20 minutes ago, you were sort of offering five or six different terms for roughly the same thing, mentalization and cognition and uh, I forget what the list was, but I think what's interesting is that for different people in our field, one or the other of those terms, even if they have a lot of overlap, one of them will be evocative and lead to an interesting observation or an interesting study being formulated, and another will fall flat. And it's, it's not that that one is the right one, but it may be the right one for that 
clinician or that researcher at that moment. And so I think we need in a way to also have ways of continuing to have multiple languages, not multiple tightly woven identities disguised as theories, but different languages because different ways of putting it will be evocative for different of us. Well, I mean, it's possible, I think, to have the same language with addendums. Stepping back and observing tells part of the story, but not all the story, and the story may vary, but at least it's in the ballpark. Mm. So I'm saying, let's be in the ballpark and then let's look for the differences. Yes, um, and the question then becomes, when a person becomes aware of this vulnerability to interpret rejection from a partner, does one need to go back to the historical roots or does one need to simply provide concurrent corrective experiences? That's an empirical question. So the person who says yes, but you need to go back, and the other person who says no, you don't, well, that's testable. Mm -hmm. So we're testing something rather than for another hundred years debating. There I'm in complete agreement. Complete agreement. Yeah. One and, thing I want to and the key is, and, and research is like theory is another loaded word. It depends on the kind of research. Mm -hmm. And I just tweeted something and Alan Francis kind of joined in and says, yes, he agrees of, of the, the gap between research and practice. And that is, it's the funding agency that says the research that needs to be done. And that's not necessarily what the clinician needs. So somehow there's got to be work and there is work being done on this to get the clinician more involved in saying, hey, here's what I need to know. Do I have to go back and interpret um, the origin or can we just deal with it in the person's life outside of the session? Or do we have to deal with it within the session? Can I produce change by just giving homework for the person to be different in, with their significant other? Or do we also need to do it in session? And let me add one, one other really important word that I learned from a guy named Marv Goldfried. Uh, I don't think this is gonna, this is not, not gonna be a challenge to you. I hope it's not X-rated. No, 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 it's not X-rated at all. It, although it's a four letter word. Oh, please. And the, word, the word is when, W-H-E-N. And that, my, that, that and my answer to that is if not now, then when? <laughs> <laughs> One other question I, I had for you guys that I wanted to at least drop uh, in with you and get your flavor, your, your thoughts. Um, so society's going through a bunch of upheaval. Uh, I have a good friend by the name of John Verveke who did a sort of now an iconic presentation on what he called the meaning crisis. Um, so one of the questions that I had for both of you, I mean, see if you answer this, Paul, I've read certainly some of your stuff. I'm curious to get your take. When you think of psychotherapy and what it means and where its focus should be and its implications for society, what does it have things, I think it inevitably has associations to think, does it have active things to say about you know, the nature of human functioning, what society should be oriented towards, the nature of the good life, um, is it the psychotherapist's responsibility at some level to be thinking deeply uh, about those kinds of elements? How does that connect? Um, or is predominantly, do you see psychotherapy in terms of, well, I want to curb psychopathology with the patient that I'm working on in the confines of uh, the hailing profession that I'm assigned? Uh, right. That's, that's a really important, really important question. Um, for, and, and maybe as Part of beginning to answer it, it may be useful for me to go back and just for 30 seconds clarify what I meant when I was saying sort of semi-facetiously about 
that important word I learned from Marv. Mm. Uh, it really did permanently change the way I thought about things clinically. And it, and it also brought out ways of thinking that were there already in me incipiently, but I hadn't articulated, which is that we, we can't describe people in purely intrapsychic terms. We don't have fixed intrapsychic structures. Our, our intrapsychic structures are always contextual. Uh, if we had these totally fixed structures, we wouldn't survive because every time we encounter something different. So part of why I was alluding to the when just a moment ago is that the, this question of do we have to go back into the past or do we, can we work on it in the present? You know, it will be different for different people in different contexts and so on. It, the questions are important to, to keep asking via research, but the research has to be differentiated. The, the way that relates to, the, to your question, Greg, is that I believe we live in contexts and that so much of our thinking, whether it's cognitive or psychoanalytic or um, you know, humanistic, uh, so much describes us as if we're a kind of system alone. Mm. As we, have, we have just characteristics, properties, and we do, but they are properties that are inherently relational. And I think what we really underestimate is how much of those properties, how much of the way we see the world and experience the world is socially situated, how much we absorb from the culture at large, from ongoing economic arrangements, from where we are placed in the world racially and ethnically and class-wise and so on. And that those are actually not a separate realm outside of personality. They are intrinsic any meaningful understanding of, of even of individual personality. So I see them as inseparable. Uh, I do think you're right in, in, in the implicit part of your question as I heard it, which is that most therapists and I have to include myself, unfortunately, you know, we can become abs absorbed in the immediate life of the person, uh, their subjective experience, their most intimate interactions, and those obviously are crucially important, but an enormous amount of the variance of how we feel, of how we make sense of any interpersonal situation is so powerfully culturally, socially, economically shaped that I- I, mean, I, I need to- Oh, I have another appointment. I thought we were huh. going to be stopped. Yeah, we're, this, this is right period. about. Mm -hmm. But let me just pick up on, on your point. Uh, I think it's the heritage of Freudian theory. It's in the body. It's not in the culture. Mm -hmm. I think it's in the spirit of the biomedical model of psychological problems. It's in the body. It's not the environment. I think more and more people throughout the world have recognized through personal experience over the past year or so that environmental factors play a very important role <laughs> in creating emotional issues. So that's personal experiential evidence. <laughs> Indeed. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll certainly honor that, Marv. We can then, uh, obviously, there'd be a lot more uh, for us to talk about. But your about. question is um, a great question, but that's, that's a whole... A whole other layer. Okay. 
Yes, well, may, maybe we'll have it someday. So um, thank you both. Uh, you got Again, for my own life journey, I'm indebted to you both. Uh, and thank you uh, for the hour and a half you spent with us. I deeply appreciate your reflections. Thank you for it together. Uh, what was and what is and what may be. I don't know that we met the expectations of solving all the world's problems, but we tinkered with a lot of different stuff and I deeply appreciate it. So thank you to you both. I very much appreciate you. your, your time. And it was certainly uh, personally very therapeutic. Yes. Uh, Good. And I had a very good experience. <laughs> great, great. Okay, well, we'll share this with the Seppi Lift Serve when it comes out in a couple of weeks. And, uh, and I look forward to continued conversations and dialogue about this. Thank you guys so Thank much. You. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Take care. Bye.